Now a warm welcome uh, to you all. Uh, please confirm you can hear me. Please confirm I am audible before yes. we start. Yes, we can hear you today. All right, wonderful. Okay, uh, so we're meeting here today to do our financial reporting and analysis for first year students our second semester. So we met on Saturday. I believe I saw a number of you on Saturday. I don't know if there are any new guys, uh, but I will just repeat just a few things uh, before we, we, we start the class. Uh, so we met on Saturday to introduce what, uh, what accounting was all about. And as I highlighted in the class, my name is James uh, from Varsity Limited Tutors. I'm a private tutor who just uh, tries to assist students here and there to see where we can match each other to make sure that you pass your course uh, at the end of the at the end of the semester. So, like I said on Saturday, uh, as we go throughout the semester, uh, specifically when we get into June, I will only be doing the classes for those of you that are interested uh, in uh, continuing the classes, and the fee is going to be uh, eight hundred rand. For you to take part in the what in the in the in the in the classes or in the lessons that we'll be doing, and for that eight hundred rand, like I said, uh, what you'll be getting, uh, you'll be getting lessons for all the five uh, units that you need to do in your study guide. That is introduction unit, uh, the unit on asset proprietorship, the unit on partnership, the unit on companies, and the unit on uh, financial analysis. Then, as I highlighted, we'll go through some homeworks together and the solutions to those homeworks. We'll go through some past exam papers, and I'll provide memos for those past exam papers. And then also, if you are paying the full amount, which is 800, you will also get assistance with the two KCQs or with the two assignments that you are going to do. That is, you have a tutor dedicated specifically to you to assist you when you want to do the assignments to make sure that you get at least 90 or 100 percent on the KCQs that you are what uh, that you are going to do during the semester of Space California financial reporting and analysis. Right. So then uh, important dates that you need to know, like I, uh, your assignments, they start on the 13th of March. So we want to make sure that by the time we get to the 30th of March, we have completed unit number one. Because unit number one, as I said, it contains most of the information that is important for financial reporting analysis. If you complete unit number one, you are even more able to get into the exam. So by 13th of March, we expect that we would have done uh, the whole of unit number one. We will now be going into unit number two, unit number three, and unit number uh, four. Then as I highlighted, if there's any load shedding issues, I will be sending through a video, a recording of myself for what we're supposed to do on that specific day. Because you know, there's uh, that load shedding calendar, which can tell me if I know that I'm going to have load shedding during the class, I'll just do a recording instead and send it to you so that we don't miss any classes. I would like us to finish the syllabus as fast as possible so that we have more time to do revision and discussions and whatnot. Okay, uh, so these are the topics. I think I've already highlighted this. And then currently we are on unit number one. So on unit number one, uh, last uh, on Saturday, we did the introduction. Uh, we did a little bit about the role of financial statements. We did a little bit about the users of the financial statements. And then we did classification, which is unit um, uh, 1.7, classification of financial information. We did a bit on that, right? So when we did classification of financial information, I introduced certain terms. I introduced uh, the term assets, the term liabilities, the term income, the term expenses, and the term equity. And I highlighted that when we meet this week, we are going to do uh, a couple of things. The first thing is we're just going to quickly look at the homework that I gave to you guys. And then number two, we are going to look at the accounting equation, which is still 1.7, right? And then after we've looked at that, then we're going to look at 1.4, 1.5, and 1.6, which are the accounting concepts and the limitations and characteristics of financial statements. Then once we've done that, then we know we are almost good to go. We can now start doing the workings. So I would really like us to do a bit of the workings maybe this coming weekend on Saturday or so, so that by next week when we start the paid lectures, uh, we know that we've at least covered the basic introduction for you guys to see how we tutor and etc. All right, so I'll start from where I ended last week, which is um, the accounting equation before we do the, 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 the theoretical part. Let's look at the accounting equation. Okay, where is my accounting equation here? 
accounting equation. Oh, sorry, sorry, the homework. Yeah, sorry, I had already forgotten about it. Let's look at the homework that I gave you. So yesterday when we were doing classification of uh, the, 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 the 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 accounting terms, when we we're talking about assets, liabilities, and etc., I asked you guys to go through uh, some of the asset examples that are given you and to what to look at uh, the solutions in terms of wh what is the description and whether it's classified as a non-current or a current asset and what is the description, and whether it's classified as a current or a non-current liability. Right. So I'm just going to rush through this one uh, so that you can also check on what we had, uh, indicated. So we're just looking at the things that are in yellow. So stock and inventory is the same thing. Stock and inventory, it is the same thing. So stock, you are basically saying, for example, if you are Mr. Price and you're selling clothes, the clothes that are in your shop, in your, in your shop are what we call stock. So stock is what you are trying to sell on a day-to-day -day basis. That is if you're selling. If you're manufacturing, is your manufacturing company, you can also have stock in the form of unfinished goods that you have not yet manufactured, i.e. the raw materials that can also be part of your what part of your stock. So stock is classified as a current asset, i.e. it is expected that within a year it is going to be gone. Then plant and equipment. Plant and equipment is basically the machinery that you are using within your organization, right? So if you're a manufacturing plant, there is some equipment that you're using within your organization is considered under your plant and equipment. So this is usually seen as a non-current asset or as a fixed asset, because it is expected that it will survive for more than 12 months within a company. A building, I think that's self-explanatory. A building is basically, a building is basically uh, the premises that which you are operating in as a company. So if you, are, if you have a property company, even the, 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 the properties that you have that people are renting can also be part of the buildings that you have as what as an organization. So a building, again, because it's expected it's going to go for more than a year, it goes under non-current assets, right? Vehicles, I think it's self excluded what a vehicle is, it's just a car. A car is also classified under non-current or long-term assets because it goes for more than 12 months. Goodwill, I think I explained goodwill in our last uh, lecture. Uh, goodwill is usually considered as a non-current asset, but it's also what we call an intangible asset. You do not usually see this in your financial statement because you cannot easily measure or record goodwill. So you usually do not see it. But if you see it, it's recorded usually under intangible assets and it's also recorded as a non-current asset. A patent, a patent is just basically a legal document that shows that you as an organization, you have ownership of a specific idea, right? So again, it's almost on the intangible side, but patents are also considered as non-current because that ownership is expected. Usually patents can be 10 year patents, or 25 year patents or 70 year patents. So it's expected to go for more than a year. So it goes under non current assets, right? And then you've got cash. Cash, you're talking at your physical cash. Usually, cash, when it's recorded, it's recorded as bank or it's recorded as petty cash or it's recorded as cash and cash equivalent. That's the same thing. Bank, petty cash, cash, and cash equivalent. Those things just fall into the same bracket. You're basically saying that this is the liquid cash that you have as an organization, whether it's physical or whether it's in the bank account at the end of the day. So this is a current asset because you don't expect cash to keep lying around. You expect it to completely change within a year. Maybe I'm going to buy some assets with it or something like that. Then debtors. Debtors are also known as a trade receivables. So sometimes you see in your balance sheet, it will write trade receivables. Those are your data. These are people that owe you money. These are people that owe you money. So for example, if you're Mr. Price and you've sold your clothes, but the people don't pay you cash, they're going to pay the cash at the end of the, at the, end of the month or at the end of two months. Those are your data or your trade receivables. So these, if as long as they are going to pay within 12 months, they are considered as a, current assets. It's very rare to get data that pay after 12 months, but if they pay after 12 months, then they might even have to be considered under non-current. But because they pay within 12 months, it is a current asset for you. So data or trade receivables fall as current assets. Then you've got a prepayment. Uh, 
a prepayment or a prepaid expenses. So for example, uh, you, you rent out. Let me give an example. So rentals usually are paid at the beginning of the month rather than at the end of the month. So let's say that your financial year ends in December. So you are preparing your financial statements and you're saying our financial year is from January to December. But in December, you pay your landlord for the next month. That is, you pay your landlord for January, right? So that is an asset to you because you're saying that we have not yet lived in the property for January. So you're paying in advance. So at any point in time, you can say, look, I no longer want to live in your property. Can you pay me back your, the rental that I paid for January? Because in January, I'm going to be moving. I don't want to be living there anymore, right? So that's how it becomes a, what an asset to you as an organization. So it falls under assets and it falls under, usually it falls under non, it falls under current assets. Because it's usually for the next month, usually preparing for next month or two months or three months. So usually insurance, things like rentals, they usually fall under um, prepayment or prepaid accounts and whatnot. Then office chairs and stuff, that is furniture. The furniture that you have is also called a what? An asset. So it usually falls under non-current because you're saying that if you buy a chair, you are not going to sell it off in one year. You're going to use it maybe for four or five years. So it's going to go under non-current assets, the office furniture that you have. Then stationary, stationary is tricky. Stationary can actually be an expense at the end of the day. If you buy stationary and you use it within a year, it's an expense. But if you have stationary at the end of the year that you did not use for that specific year, it goes under assets. It goes under assets. It usually it's put under inventory or stock. So it's going to be a current asset because you're expecting to use it within the what within the next year then intellectual property that's the same as what as patents so this is homework number one that i gave you so i hope you did well if there are any questions feel free to ask but i hope you did well on this one let's look at the other one so homework number two i said look at liabilities and again try to explain what the liability is and whether it's a non-current or it's a current liability. Let's see someone posted something. Okay. Non-current or a current liability. All right. So let's look at the liabilities that I gave you. So I hope, you, I, I, like I urge you guys, do these little homeworks that I give you because it helps you capture some of the stuff that we're trying to do. All right. So we say the one-year bank loan. Right. So a one-year bank loan can actually be a current liability because they're saying that it's expected to be paid within one year. So it can actually be a current liability. The same thing is an overdraft. An overdraft is considered as a current liability. Why? Because it's short term in nature. You expect to pay it over a couple of months. But if the bank loan is now two years, three years, five years, 10 years, and et cetera, it now goes into long-term part, which means it's now a non-current liability, right? And then if you look at the ventures, bonds, mortgages, these are non-current. Because the debentures, bonds, and mortgages, they usually extend for more than a year. But be careful on the debenture. If the debenture is got an abbreviation, for example, they might say a six months debenture, which means it's for six months. But most of the time, debentures, bonds, and mortgages are long term in nature. So they are going to fall under non current uh, liabilities, right? And then if you look at something called uh, income received in advance. So income received in advance, you're basically saying that. Um, Let's say you operate properties, you have properties, right? And uh, your tenants, they pay maybe for the next two years, they are renters for the next two years. Although you have received this rental and you can, you know, show it up and you can go and uh, buy some, some, some KFC with it. But to you, it's a liability because you are saying that they have not yet lived in your property for two years. So if they decide to move out of your property today, you owe them the money they paid in advance. So you have to pay it back to them. So that's a liability. So if income is received in advance, it's a liability to you as an organization. Then you've got what we call accruals. Accruals, they are different types of accruals. They are accrued expenses, accrued taxes, accrued dividends. So if it's accrued taxes, it's a tax liability, which means that you have been charged a tax by SaaS, but you have not yet paid for it. So that's again a liability. Dividend liabilities, it means that you have declared that we want to pay dividends for the last year, 
but you've not yet paid the dividend. So again, it's going to be a what? A liability to you as an organization. Then accrued expenses is just an expense that you've not yet paid for. So for example, your electricity bill. So let's say that you don't have prepaid electricity. You have to pay the bill at the end of the month. So if you don't pay your electricity bill for three months, it means that you have accrued your expense for three months. So that's a liability to you as an organization. So that's explanation on liabilities. I believe that's clear. So let's look at the last homework. So this one, I'm not going to do everything. I'm just going to pick a couple of them. But if there's something specific that you did not understand, please highlight it to me. If there's something specific that you did not understand, please highlight it to me. So these terms that you see here, you are going to see them when you're looking at your trial balance. Someone says, is income received in advance a current liability? Yeah, income received in advance is a current liability. As long as the advance part, right, is uh, within 12 months. So like I'm saying, if someone pays you next year's rent house today, if they decide to move out tomorrow, which means you have to pay them back the rent that they paid for next year. Because what? Because they did not stay in your property for next year. So it's a liability and it's current because it's within the next what, 12 months. But if they paid for more than 12 months, then it might go now into long-term territory. But as long as they paid for the next 12 months or so, then it falls under current liabilities. Okay, thank you for that question. Okay, so under income and expenses, I highlighted here that the list of all of these things, some of them are assets, some of them are liabilities, some of them are income, some of them are expenses. I'm not going to do all of them. But what is important, like I was saying to you guys, these things are going to be in the trial balance. And the trial balance are going to be asked to prepare a statement of financial position. You are going to be asked to prepare a statement of comprehensive income. You are going to be asked to prepare a cash flow statement. So for you to prepare those things, you need to understand what falls under what. Because all of those statements, they're basically categorization of accounting terms. So that's why it is important for you to understand some of these nitty gritties. But some of them, they're a bit far-fetched because you know it's a homework <laughs> so that you open up your mind. But a number of them, you will notice them in your what? In your exams or in your assignments when you do them. So for example, depreciation. You might ask, what is depreciation? Depreciation is an expense. So I think I've explained on, on Saturday, when you buy a vehicle, right? When you buy a vehicle, for example, uh, let's say we buy a vehicle today, and then we use the vehicle for two years, right? If we use the vehicle for two years, after two years, the value that we bought the vehicle can no longer be the same. If we bought it for 500,000, it is no longer worth 500,000. It is worth less. That loss in value is what we call depreciation. And that is a what an expense to the organization. Someone says, where does discounts allowed fit? So discounts allowed is an income to the organization. So if you are buying something, and you're offered a discount. If you're buying something and you're offered a discount, that falls under your incomes. So you will notice when we do the uh, statement of comprehensive income, we're going to have a side, we're going to say sales, and then after sales, we're going to say other income. So that is where discount allowed to fit in. It's actually an income because you're saying that you should have been expensed, but you're getting your money back at the what? At the end of the day, right? So that's what? Um, someone says, is video recording on? Yes, yes, we are recording the, the lecture. So uh, that's 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 our discounts allowed. So let's see uh, what else can we pick up here uh, that I think might be problematic to you guys. I think most of these things are very straightforward. Um, okay, let's see, rent paid, dividends, interest paid, marketing costs. All right, let me just run down. Um, session, that's an expense. Amortization, that's an expense. Sales, uh, that's uh, an income. Sales returns, that is um, in sales returns. It's, it's, it's like an expense, so to say. It, when you are preparing it, you will fall sort of as an expense, but it's not an expense, but you will fall off sort of as an expense in your income segment. But you see it when we deal with it. 
you will see it when we do with it in our income statement, how it falls, because it deducts from your sales. Because you're saying income is sales, but if someone returns a product to you as an organization, it's no longer under sales. So it reduces your income at the end of the day. So although it's not technically an expense, it will act as an expense at the end of the day, right? Uh, then you've got salaries. Salary is an expense. Commission to agents, that's an expense. Royalties received, that's an income. Rent paid, uh, that's an expense. Rent received, that's an income. Wages, that's an expense. Dividend received, that is uh, an income. Um, dividends paid, that's an expense. Uh, interest uh, received, that is an income. Um, interest paid, that's an expense, I think. Bed debts. Let's talk about bed debts. Bed debts. So when you're operating an organization, you're going to lend uh, people products, right? So someone comes into your shop, they uh, take a product and they say, I'll pay at the end of the month. Like you remember the Mr. Price example that I was giving you. They say they'll pay at the end of the month, right? So what happens if they do not pay? which means that you were support, you had recorded sales as an, as an income, right? But you're no longer going to get those sales. So that is now an expense to you as an organization. If someone does not pay you, that's an expense to you as an organization. Although it was an asset at a certain point in time because it was a data or it was a trade receivable, but because they've chosen not to pay you as an organization, it then becomes an expense to you. So that's what bad debt is, yes? Yeah? Then loss on sale of assets. Loss on sale of assets, these ones are a bit tricky now. Loss on sale of assets is an expense. But what happens now is when you have an asset, right? For example, a vehicle. Remember we said the vehicle is an asset because we are saying you are not in the business of selling cars, but you are in the business of maybe deliver or something and you are using your vehicles for delivery and whatnot. And you decide, no, we want to buy new delivery vehicles. Let's sell the old ones. So you can either sell them at a profit or we can either sell them at a loss. We'll do some examples in the future of how it becomes a profit or a loss. But if you sell them at a loss, you have to expense it. If you sell them at a profit, it becomes an income to you as an organization, right? So that's uh, that, that one. And then there's provision for bad debts. Remember, we talked about bad debts. And then we're talking about provision for bad debts. So this one is different from bad debts. It's the same principle, but it's slightly different. And I see people get confused usually when they do with provision for bad debts. So a bad debt, we are saying someone is not going to pay you the money. But provision for bad debts, we are saying that you think that the person might not pay you. They might pay, they might not pay. You don't know, but you suspect that they might not pay you. But bad debts, they actually have not paid you. You know that you're never going to get your money back. That's bad debts. So if you know you're never going to get your money back, it's an expense. But provision for bad debts, the actual account for provision for bad debts reduces your assets at the end of the day. But if it increases or if it decreases, it then becomes an income or an expense. So an increase in the provision for bed debts. Where we are saying provision for bed debts is we are assuming that someone, let's say all of your accounts, and you have got 10 people that owe you 10,000 rand, right? You've got 10 people that owe you 10,000 rand. And they're saying that out of these 10 people that owe me 10,000 rand, there is this guy that I suspect that owes me 1,000. That ah, I don't think that person is going to pay me back my money. So in order for you, uh, we were going to talk about accounting concepts. So in order for you to do what is proper in your books, you're going to say, ah, you know what? Let me not record this person that owes me 1,000 rand because I suspect that they might not pay me back. So if that increases next year, it becomes 2,000. That's an expense to you. If it reduces next year, it becomes 500. That's an income to you. You will see when we do the examples how practical it becomes. But what you need to know is an increase in provision for bad debts is an expense, whereas a decrease in the provision for bad debts is an income. But the account itself, the provision for bad debts account, that does not fall under income or expenses. It actually subtracts from our assets at the end of the day. But don't worry if you didn't understand it, we'll do examples in the future when we do the workings. All right. So I think maybe those are the key ones. The rest of them, the ones are from gains and whatnot. These ones, your lecturer does not usually ask them, but for your own information, get some time to work through them. I'm sure they will be of great assistance to you. All right. So that's it with the homeworks that I gave you. So now let's go to accounting equation. 
Okay, where is my accounting equation here? Just want to do the accounting equation first, and then we can uh, do the concepts. All right, accounting equation. <laughs> So those five concepts that we just explained, assets, equity, liabilities, uh, and income and expenses. When you're doing accounting, when you're preparing your income statement, when you're preparing your balance sheets, when you're preparing your cash flow statements, those are the things that you always be dealing with. So they create what is called an accounting equation. An accounting equation, the basic accounting equation, simply states that assets are equal to equity plus liabilities. Asset, this is just the basic accounting knowledge that I'm teaching you. Because the reason why I want you guys to know this, it, it will be easier for you to understand some of the more complicated things that I'll talk about. So assets is equals to equity plus liabilities. What does that mean in layman's terms? So remember what we said assets are. We said assets are economic resources that you have as an organization. So if you have economic resources, this is what we have as a company. But how did we obtain the stuff? How did we get this asset? That is where we're saying assets is cost equity plus liability. So it's basically what we have is equals to how did we buy it? So let's say that my asset is a house, right? My asset is a house. That's what my asset is. If I bought the house using my own cash, that is equity. Remember what we said equity is. Equity represents the owner's interest. So if I bought the house using my own cash, that is equity. But if I bought the house using a mortgage loan, what is that? That is a liability because that's a debt. That is amount that I owe. So if my house is worth 1 million rand and I use the 100,000 of my own cash plus a mortgage of 900,000, what am I saying? I'm saying assets is equal to equity plus liability. I'm saying 1 million rand in assets, which is the house, is equal to equity, which is 100,000 cash plus liabilities, which is 900,000. So 1 million is equal to 100 plus 900. If you add 100 plus 900, what does it equal? It also equals 1 million. So 1 million is equals to 1 million. So that is what is called the accounting equation. At a certain point in time, you will learn of what is called double entry. So this is how double entry is created in accounting. We're saying that at both sides, everything should be equal. The asset should always be equal to how did I obtain the asset? I cannot have more or less of one thing, right? I cannot have more or less of one thing. So someone might ask, ah, what if, let's give an example. Someone might ask here, let me do this, just to show you what I mean. So someone might ask, what if after I had put 100,000 in cash and I taken a bank loan for 900,000, what if when I bought the house, they gave me a discount and said, oh no, you can buy the house for 950,000. The equation is no longer equal because I have got equity 100,000 and I have a loan 900,000, but the house I bought it for 950,000. It's still equal, but let me show you how it is equal. Remember assets, how many assets do I now have? I now have 950,000 in assets, which is the what? Which is the house. But because I bought the house for 950,000, I still have got 50,000 cash, which I have left. So I have 50,000 cash as an asset also. Remember, we said cash is an asset, right? Which is now equal to the 100,000 that I contributed plus the 900,000 that was what? That was contributed by the bank, which is the what? Which is the mortgage. So whatever you're going to do, assets will always be equal to equity plus liabilities. So as an organization, as you operate, as you buy certain things, they are going to affect this accounting equation that we're talking about. So as they affect this accounting equation, at the end of the day, it will always be equal. It will always be equal at the, at the, end, of the, at the end of the day, right? So let's see what I mean when I say it's always going to be equal, right? So let's go through a couple of things here. I just want you to show you how it will always be equal, right? So the first thing we said we've got an asset, which is a house, is equals to equity, which is what I contributed towards buying the house, and the liability, which is the loan that I got from F&B to buy the house. So I'm, I've opened a property company, right? I've opened a 
property company. I want to buy and sell properties, right? So the first thing that I do in my property company, right? I'm going to put an advert to sell the house because it's a property company I want to sell the house. So I'm going to put an advert to sell the house, right? So when I put an advert to sell the house, what is going to happen to me, right? So what is going to happen is I have to pay for the advert, correct? I have to pay for the advert. So I have to pay how much for the advert? I have to pay 1,000 for the advert. Right? So if I have to pay 1,000 for the advert, and remember, I've taken all of the money that I had, right, and put it to the house, which means I'm now introducing new cash into the business. So if I am introducing new cash into the business, I am simply saying, I have got what? One thousand year is equal. Sorry, one million year is equals to hundred plus 900 just follow me a little bit here just want to show you something so for me to be able to pay for the outfit i have to first introduce the cash because i don't have any cash here so i'm gonna increase my cash in my account by 1000 but because i've increased my cash in my account by 1000 this means that i have more equity remember 100,000 represents equity here so this is equity in the business Right, so which means now my equity is plus another one thousand because I've introduced new cash from my own pocket in the what? So this one is liability. So is the equation still the same? Yes, because I now have one million one thousand on one side and one million one thousand on the other side. So nothing has changed here. But I'm going to pay for the ad. So what happens if I pay for the advert? So if I pay for the advert, I go to the advertising house and I pay. What happens is I am going to what? To use the cash, which means I'm going to transfer cash out of my account, which is 1,000 out of the account. And whenever we have an expense, expenses reduce equity, whereas income increases equity. So I'm gonna put this here for you. Income increases equity. Whereas what expenses reduce equity, right? So I'm gonna have to reduce my equity by the expense of what? Of 1,000. So at the end of the day, you will notice I'm still balancing. I still have 1 million on one side and 1 million on the other side. All right, let's go to the next one. I go to the city council they charge me some rates for the property that I own, right? They charge me 5,000 in rates. They take the money out of my account. But I didn't have any cash in my account because remember, I've used up all of my cash. So what happens to my account? My account is now overdrawn at the bank. I now have an overdraft facility at the bank. So what happens with the overdraft facility at the bank? Let's do this to show you that I'm still balancing because I want to show you that I will still balance because it's important to understand that. In accounting that you still have to balance at the end of the day, right? So after we did our transactions, we're left with this, right? After we paid the advert, we're left with this. Right? So now I have an overdraft at the bank. So remember, an overdraft is a liability because I paid 5,000 from a bank account with not have money. I now have an extra liability at FNB of 5,000 rand. But what did I do, right? I also reduced my equity. How did I reduce my equity? Because rates are an expense. Remember, expenses reduce equity. So if you do your mathematics here again, notice you're still balancing. You still have 1 million is equals to 1 million at the end of the day. Because if you say 100 minus 5 plus 900 plus 5, it will give you 1 million. So I still have 1 million at the end of the, at the, end of the day. So nothing has changed here. I'm still balancing my what? I'm still balancing my accounts, right? Let's go to the third entry. I sell the house for 1.5 million. Oh, I've sold the house now for 1.5 million. So what happens to my account if I pay the sell the house for 1.5 million? So this is going to happen. I'm going to receive 1.5 million in cash, right? So 1.5 million. So this is cash. Cash, remember it's an asset, is equals to what is my equity? Remember, my equity before was 100,000. It was what? It was 100,000, right? But what did we say about income? We said income increases equity. So what is my income from this transaction? 
So remember, the house was worth 1 million, but I've saved it for 1.5 million. So which means I've gotten an extra 500,000 profit. So my income is 500,000. So my equity is going to increase by what? By 500,000, right? And then my liability, I still have it as what? As 900,000, right? Because nothing has changed, right? So add these things up, you are going to get 1.5 million is equals to 1.5 million. So it's still the same thing. Assets is equals to equity plus liabilities. Then the last entry, I pay back the bank 900,000. So what happens if I pay back the bank 900,000? Okay, let's see what happens if I pay the bank 900,000, all right? So I've done this transaction here. Now I decide to pay back the bank the money that they borrowed me. So if I pay back the bank 900,000, I'm going to lose cash, correct? Because I'm paying them back 900,000. So I lose cash 900,000 here. But I also lose this liability because I no longer owe anyone money, right? So at the end of the day, how much do I still have? in my company, I'm going to see that, oh, after all of these transactions are done, I'm going to left with 600,000 cash is equal to 600,000 equity plus zero liabilities. Right. So again, my equation is still balancing at the end of the day. So that's basically what the accounting equation is. The reason why this is important is you're going to hear me say your balance sheet should balance. Your cash flow statement should balance. All those entries, you, you have not recorded them correctly in terms of your income statement. Why? Because you have not performed the double entry part of the accounting part. So for you guys, it's not very, very important to know double entry, but it is important for you to understand it because you're not going to be doing the recording part, but it's important for you to understand why we say something must balance at the end of the day and how one transaction can affect both sides of the equation at the end of the day. But that is what is called the accounting equation. So now we are done with, uh, with the accounting equation. We can now go into accounting concepts now. I believe you, you will now understand accounting concepts when we talk about them. All right, so let's see. Accounting concepts, that's where we are now. All right. So accountants, by their very nature, right? Because organizations are going to be different, right? You might be operating in a mine, you might be operating in a grocery shop, in a tax shop, in a clothes shop and whatnot. But all accountants are basically doing the same thing. So over time, they noticed that you know, accountants were starting to do funny things. Each accountant did their own way of doing things. So in order to avoid confusion, in order to allow investors, in order to allow people to be able to assess the financial performance of different companies, they came together and decided, let's create a standard framework of financial accounting. Let's create a standard convention of how do you present accounting documents, right? So this is what is now called general accepted accounting practices. We are saying that when you are presenting your accounting, when you are talking about accounting, this is what we expect you to do as a what as an accountant, right? So this also helps you guys who are going to be managers at your workplaces. So that when you look at the accounts, you know how your accountant prepared the accounts. You know that, oh, use this, use this, use this. This means that and whatnot and whatnot. So that's basically it. So there is, uh, in South Africa, there's what is called SICA, which is just basically the governing body of the accountants in South Africa. But internationally, we talk about what you call IFRS, which is International Financial Reporting Standards. There are many of them, but we are not going to go deep into that. That's not important. But what is important now is what we call accounting concepts, what we call accounting concepts. So accounting concepts, these are basically key principles of accounting that you as a manager, that you as a student need to understand. So if you don't understand anything that I'm going to say for the next 15 or so minutes, please highlight so that I can repeat it because it's going to come in your, in your assignments. These are very popular in your assignments. And it's also going to affect how you prepare uh, your, your income statements, your balance sheets and whatnot when we start doing that. But specifically in your assignments, these are very popular. So you also need to understand them.
So the first concept is what is called the money measurement concept. The money measurement concept. So we're saying that when you are an accountant, you cannot write on your balance sheet. We have two buildings. We've got three cars. We've got five cows. We've got three impalas or something like that. No one will understand what that means. What we need for you as an accountant is give us the dollar or the rand value of your assets. Don't just say that I've got two buildings. So what? Tell us I have 300,000 rand worth of buildings. I have 1 million worth of vehicles. So that's the money measurement concept. We're saying that as an accountant, you don't describe your assets. Rather, you give us the value of your specific assets. Just a short name and the value of the assets is enough for the reader of financial statement. Now, also on that term, you cannot say on your accounting statement that I received 5 million rand and then also I received 5 million pula. I also received 5 million euro. That doesn't make sense to anyone. Give us one currency. So you convert all of the different currencies that you accepted as an organization and present everything in one specific currency. So number one, you have to prevent everything in monetary terms. Then number two, you have to present everything in one specific currency. So that's the money measurement concept of what? Of accounting, right? Then the second one is called the materiality concept. The materiality concept, you are basically saying that there are certain things that it's unnecessary for you to present them because of the value that they have. And there are certain things that it is of utmost importance for them to be highlighted because of the value of those things. So for example, let's say you buy paper clips. I hope you all understand what a paper clip is, right? Let's say you buy paper clips at your workplace, right? So a paper clip, you might, uh, it might be, for example, a box of paper clips. You might, let's say, buy it for, for five rand, a small box of paper clips. Let's say it's worth five rand, right? And then you have used half of it, right? And you are left with half a box. So let's say it's now worth two rand fifty, right? So you cannot go onto your balance sheet and then record and say, we have got uh, an asset of paper clips, two rand fifty. It's not worth it. If your balance sheet is in the millions of rands, it's not worth for you to record that specific thing. You rather just write miscellaneous expenses and expenses, even though it is an asset, write miscellaneous and expenses and expenses as an asset. So that's what we're basically saying. The smaller the expense, it becomes unnecessary for you to try to delve down into some of those nitty gritties. So you will notice if you check into companies uh, a financial statements on the stock exchange, you will notice they were miscellaneous expenses and they were write 30,000 rand. To them, it's miscellaneous because it's an addition of so many small things that they could not individually say, oh, this was for cups, this was for, you know, it's not necessary. So that's what we're saying under materiality. Or on the other hand, you cannot say miscellaneous expenses and then record 3 billion in miscellaneous expenses. That's not miscellaneous, that's material. So tell us, how did you get to 3 billion? Tell us, oh, under 3 billion, there were some vehicles that we purchased and there were some uh, buildings that we didn't work with. So you cannot lump everything up and say 3 billion miscellaneous. That, that, that's, you are breaking the materiality concept. So if it is very big, record it properly. If it's very small, you can lump it up at the end of the day. Right. So that's, uh, that's materiality uh, concept. Our next one is historic cost. So this one is one of those things that if you're not an accountant, you might really ask, are you guys serious? Because when we're doing accounting, we record things at the historic cost. So for example, if you've got a building that you buy to, that you bought, let's say, um, uh, in, in the year 2000, right? You bought a building in the year 2000 and you bought it for, let's say it's a flat, you bought it for 100,000 rand. At that time, 100,000 rand was worth a lot, right? So you bought 100,000 rand. So you record it in your financial statements as building 100,000 rand. That's the value of the building until you sell it. So in 2002, right now, that building will be written as building 100,000 rand. Of course, if over time, you might make certain adjustments, but normally you record it at the historic costs and then you make the adjustments later. You record it at the historic cost. Although the building right now might now be worth 3 million, you will record it at the historic cost unless something has happened that has re resulted in you wanting to revalue the building or something like that. 
but in accounting, all assets are recorded at their original historic cost, i.e. the cost at which they were purchased at the beginning of the what? Of, 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 of your business or whatever it was. So that's the historic cost concept. So you notice we will say in our balance sheet, we've got a cost of the asset and then you say depreciation and then whatnot. But there is, just to make sure that you don't get confused, there is also for those that are going to do pure accounting, we're going to talk about revaluation of assets and whatnot. But for everyone else, just know this historic cost, right? We'll go to the next one, double entry concept. So this is accounting equation, what I was talking about. So we say for every entry that you do, so for every debit, there is going to be a credit entry. Right? So let me show you something here. Uh, just bear with me. Let me show you something here. Uh, let's see what do I want to do here. Or uh, let's give me a white book. I just want you to understand what debit and credit means so that you understand what I mean when I say debit, credit. Okay. All right, let's not use this one. I confuse people. <laughs> Let me use um all right, it's fine, pink. All right. So when we are doing accounting. We've got, uh, all right, sorry, 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 guys, sorry. I was wondering why I was deleting this. I wanted to put this instead, okay. All right, like this. So these are called T accounts when you're doing account. For you guys, it's not going to be important because you're not going to do T accounts that much, but you might see them in your KCQ. You might see one or two things in your KCQ to do with T accounts but it will help us explain what are debits and what are credits, right? So we've got our bank here, right? And then we've got our asset here. So let's say this is a, let's say this is a car, vehicle expense account, vehicle account. Right? So in accounting, everything that you have is recorded in what is called a T account. Right. So T account are sometimes when you do deep accounting, we call them journals and whatnot. But for the purposes of this, let's just call them T accounts, right? So you record them in an account. So each account, it is got what is called a debit side and it is what is called a credit side. So debit we usually represent it with DR, credit we usually represent it with CR, right? So each account is got a debit side and a credit side, right? Debit side. The DR represents debit, CR represents credit. So what we mean when we say double entry, we are saying that for each transaction, it will be recorded twice. Each transaction is going to be recorded twice within the what? Within, uh, within, uh, within, within, within the organization. Each transaction is going to be recorded twice, right? Within the organization, right? All right. So for example, if you get money that comes into the what? In, if, let's say you've got 1,000 in your bank. Let's say that this is where you started. Let's say uh, this is your opening balance, right? Uh, opening balance, your balance brought down, right? And let's say that you've got what? 1,000, right? That's what you have at the beginning of the year, right? So if you have 1,000 in your bank account, right? And then you decide, right, that I am going to buy a vehicle you decide I'm going to buy a vehicle. So when you buy this vehicle, money is going to go outside your bank account. So when this money goes outside your bank account, it's a, it's a credit on the bank account. So whenever money goes out of the bank account, it's going to credit, right? So it's going to use 1,000 on the credit side because it's money outside the bank. So the balance here is going to be zero because you've taken money out. With 1,000 side, 1,000 side, so the balance is going to be zero, right? But this money that you've taken out, you cannot record it once, you have to record it twice. So where else will you record it? You are going to record it into the car. Because you're saying that you are going to take 1,000, you're going to buy a car. 
So you're going to come here and record the what? The 1,000 here, and you're going to narrate it as a what? As the new car that I've bought for the what? For the business, right? So this is what we mean when we say double entry. We're saying that each transaction is recorded twice. So 1,000 goes out of the business. We record it as a credit in our, what? In our bank account, but that 1,000 is used to buy a vehicle. So we are going to record it as a debit to the car account. So this is an asset account. We have a debit balance because we've bought a what? We've bought a car. So let's assume that after using the car for a little bit, we decide to sell the car. So if you sell the car, which means you are offsetting it from the asset account. So you're going to say what? I've sold the car for 1,000 again, right? So you sell the car for 1,000, right? So you have sold it for 1,000. So their car account is now zero because there's no more balance in the what in the car account. But once you sell the car, what do you get when you sell the car? You get cash, right? So if you get cash, where does it go? Onto the debit side of the what? Of the bank account. So you now have 1,000 in this what? In this account because you've what? You've sold the car. So any cash that is coming into the bank is going to go to the debit side. Whereas any expense outside the bank is going to go to the credit side, right? At the end of the day but that's not what is important what is important for you guys is what i'm trying to learn the double entry system that each transaction is going to affect at least two accounts it's going to affect the bank account and the car account it's going to affect the bank account and the sales account it's going to affect the bank account and the expenses account it's going to affect the profit account and this different account there are always two accounts that are going to be affected by whatever transactions that you're doing as a specific what as a specific business so that's the double entry system so for every debit entry there is a credit entry for that same amount so everything should always balance that's why i was talking about the balancing under the accounting equation all right so that's double entry concept going content concept we're saying that when you're operating a business and when you're preparing your accounts you assume that the business is going to survive for the next 12 months. That is very, very important. The reason why that important is remember historic concepts that we talked about. So if you don't assume that, if you think that, ah, this business is going to close this year, maybe in two months time, we're going to close this business. Then your books should be recorded in what is called the net realizable value, but that's not important. But it should be recorded at net realizable value. Why? Because you're saying we're going to sell the business off. So we cannot record things at historic concept. But if we assume going concept, then we record everything at historic concept, right? So it's very important for the historic concept. So going concept simply means we assume that the business is going to continue in perpetuity for the next at least 12 months or two years or whatever we want to call but at least for the next four months, this business is going to continue operating, right? Then accounting period, uh, this one we're basically saying that you have to have a definite accounting period. It's important for some of the stuff that we want to talk about later. So normally, most businesses, their accounting period end in February. The reason why they end in February is because of SARS. SARS, they want their accounts to end in February. It's easier to just match to SARS. But if you don't want it to end in February, it's fine. You can end in December, you can end in August, it's up to you. But you notice a number of businesses, they try to match to end of February because usually that's when SARS becomes problematic and what, so that it becomes easier for you to do your taxes and your books also. But a number of businesses also end in December. So it just depends. But in short, an accounting period is usually one year. They may, it may be six months, it may be one month, but usually it's one year. So we are saying you are reporting for one year. So every expense that you are recording is expense for the last 12 months. Every asset transaction that you are recording is asset for the next for the last 12 months. So that is where, remember when I was talking about uh, current assets and current liabilities, and I was saying that it should not exceed one year and whatnot, that is where it comes from, from the accounting period concept. Because we are saying that if you are doing things for one year, therefore current assets can only last for one year. Current liabilities can only last for one year. If they go beyond one year, they are no longer current because they are now outside the accounting period concept. Right? Let's go to the next one, a matching concept. So matching concept now, we are saying revenues and expenses that you are receiving should be matched. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say that you have uh, what we call a project, right? You have a project, you are an engineering company. You got a, a, a project to build roads. 
for the next five years, right? So the government will pay you in installments, right? They won't pay you after five years. They will pay you in installments, right? And also you're going to have expenses in installments. But the project is for five years, the contract is for five years. So you cannot say I'm going to record revenues after five years after the project is complete and then the expenses i'm going to record them every year as i as i get them no you have to match so even if the government is not paid you for this year even if they've not paid you your cash for this year but because you know that this year with 50 percent of the expenses of this project in this year therefore 50 percent of the revenues for that project should be recorded in that year even though they have not yet been paid you can put them now under your what under your assets being what being uh income uh accrued or income not yet paid by the what by the government so revenues and expenses should be matched for specific years proportionally so that's the matching concept it's almost similar to uh one of the points that i want to talk about which is accruals all right so then we've um conservatism uh concept so this one we're basically saying that um how do i put this I uh, remember the example that I gave you at the beginning of the class when I said um, you assume that someone is not going to pay you money, that 10,000, uh, people owe you 10,000 rand, but you know that someone uh, is not going to pay me my 1,000. So that's conservatism. So you cannot record the 10,000 and say, oh, people owe me 10,000 when you know very well that there's a guy who will not pay you 1,000. So you have to remove the guy who will not pay you 1,000. You are being conservative. Right. So it's the same thing in accounting. You always underestimate your profits and overestimate your expenses. So if you are looking at your car, you, the, 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 uh, if you are, I don't want to use this example because it's going to, 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 to change something about the historic concept. Let me try something different. Um, if you want to value something in a business, right? Your stock, for example, your stationery, your stock at the end of the year, your inventory. If you think that it's worthless, then record the less value, don't record the higher value. If you think it's worthless, record the less value, don't record the higher value. So when you're doing your asset valuations, you record the lower values. When you're doing your profit valuations, you record the lower values. But when you're doing your expense valuations, you record the higher expenses at the end of the day. So that's conservative. You have to be conservative in your estimates that you make in your business. So whenever you're applying estimates, you have to be conservative with your estimates, specifically unit. That's why you have provision for bad debts because you are thinking that someone will not pay you. So you are going to say, no, let's not record this at the end of the day. All right, um, realization principle. Almost similar to matching concept, but what we're basically saying is as soon as you have an income, that you have earned as a business, you record it, you realize it, you record it. So for example, um, businesses that have subscriptions, right? So a subscription is an income, but a subscription might not be paid, but someone subscribed. So if I subscribe for a service and I promise they said that I'm going to be paying a DSTV for the next 12 months, I've subscribed for DSTV, right? They have earned an income, so they should realize that they have an income in the form of subscriptions, regardless of whether I've paid or not, right? Then if they notice next year that I've not paid, then they can write it off as a bad debt. But right now they record it as an income because they've realized the income. They know I'm going to pay for it, maybe next month or whatever, whenever I want to pay for it, but they've realized and what an income at the end of the day. So all incomes should be realized. All expenses should that have been incurred should also be recognized as such. Right. Then accruals concept. Now accruals is almost similar to uh to, to matching concept. We were basically saying that, for example, uh your water bill, if you don't have prepaid water, your water bill. So you get your water bill at the end of the month. They come and read your meter and say this is the water that you spent in December. Right. So when you pay your water bill in January, you're not paying the bill for January, you're paying the bill for December when you use the water. So if you are doing your accounts, right, if you have not yet paid the bill but it's already done, you've already used the material, you have to record it. Although you've not paid for it, you have to record it as a bill. So if we use water this year, although we will pay it next year, we record it as an expense for this year. 
and then we record uh, a liability that we owe the city council this much, but we have to record the expense this particular year. So that's a cross concept. Um, let's see. Oh, ah, yes. I think we are done with the accounting concepts part. All right. So I think we're left with uh, two small sections that we just need to do. Let's see. Are there any questions on the concepts? Okay, I hope they are clear. So now we are only left with 1.5 and 1.6. 1.5 is value and limitations of financial statements, and 1.6 is characteristics. 1.8, remember I said, that's when we are going to spend almost a month. So we're going to start that one on Saturday. So allow me guys to just take maybe five to 10 minutes to do those other two sessions so that we know that we've covered them for today so that we don't have to do them on Saturday again. So let's look at uh, value and limitations of financial statements and then characteristics of good financial statements. But all of this comes from what we've just learned. So when you are preparing your financial statements, there are problems, they have limitations, they have challenges that they provide us as organizations, right? So the first one, I've already talked about this, the historic concept. Remember, you record assets in historic costs. You bought the building, you bought the flat in 2000, it was 100,000. Now it's worth millions, but you still have to replace because of that. So sometimes financial statements, they don't really reflect the true value of the company. Why? Because the assets are recorded at the historic cost. Whereas there is inflation out there, but they're recorded at the historic cost. That's problem number one. Problem number two is what we call inflation. Inflation is the input in prices. So remember, our bread, uh, I think two years ago or three years ago, it was going for around 11 rand, 10 rand. But now it's going for almost 17 to 18 rand, a loaf of bread, right? So you will notice that the expenses for two years ago, they were probably the organization, I mean, let's say 100,000 in expenses, but now it is 300,000 in expenses. And you think, oh, the organization is more expenses, but no, not necessarily. They may be paying for the same thing, but the prices have changed. So it might look like the organization is growing. It might look like the, the managers are failing, but most of the time, nothing might have changed. It's just the price that have changed. That's inflation. So sometimes your financial statements do not reflect inflation at the end of the day. And if you operate in a country where there's hyperinflation, countries like Zimbabwe, Venezuela, and et cetera, where there's a lot of hyperinflation, it's going to be a problem for you as an accountant. What is the true value of something when the price is constantly going up, right? right? So that's another thing. Then non-monetary items. So there are certain things, for example, if you go to uh, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and you check the financial statements for those companies, they don't tell you how many people are working at the company. They don't tell you how many degrees the managers have at the company. They don't tell you how many kilometers the drivers at the company travel. But that information might actually be important to you as an investor, but they don't show all of it. They just tell you the dollar value but at the end of the day. So that's another problem with our financial statements, right? Then our fourth thing, they're backward looking. So remember, financial statements reporting, you are reporting for the last year. You're not reporting for the future. So I might say that the company made 3 million profit last year, but guess what? The same company in two months time, it might be closing down. Maybe they lost a contract with the government. Maybe they're being sued for billions of dollars. The financial statement will not even say that. It will just say they made 3 million in profit. So they are backward looking, they are not forward looking, and that is a problem, right, for, uh, for managers, right? And then number five is different accounting policy. Now we've tried to solve this by creating GAP, IFRS, and accounting concepts. But nevertheless, there are still some things that accountants will always be different in terms of their reporting. And those differences in accounting policies are going to create problems for you to understand them. Then lastly, unrecorded value. Remember I said goodwill, you usually don't see it in an accounting statement. Why? Because it's difficult to measure, it's difficult to value it. So there are certain things that are not recorded in accounting statements that are very, very important and very, very valuable to businesses. So these are your limitations of your of your accounting are statements. Then lastly, the characteristics of a good financial statement. These ones, I would want you guys to, uh, to do them as a homework. Please go through and read them. If there's anything that you do not understand on the characteristics of good financial statements, you can come back to me. But we're basically asking ourselves this question. How do I tell if a financial statement is good? 
how do I tell if a certain thing has been done properly? And there's a list of them. They are very self-explanatory. But if you don't understand anything, when we meet next time, you can ask me the question and I'll explain it to you. But this is going to be your homework today. The characteristics of a good financial statement. Now, when we meet next year on, on Saturday, I think we're meeting on Saturday. When we meet on uh, Saturday, right? We are going to do our income statement. We are going to do income statement, which is our own unit number 1.8. So unit number 1.8, we are introducing the income statement. We're introducing the balance sheet. We're introducing the cash flow statement, all of these different things. But for Saturday, we are mainly going to look at the income statement, right? That's what we are going to look at. How do you prepare an income statement? Now, this is worth 25 marks or 20 marks in an exam because it usually comes, it's very rare not to see this question on an income statement. So please ensure you attend on Saturday so that we can do it together so that you can know how to prepare an income statement. Then uh, just a reminder, uh, from next week, uh, Tuesday, the classes will be paid for. So if you still interested in uh, joining through the classes, please join us on Saturday. Saturday is for free. Please join through and see how we do income statements. But going forward from a Tuesday next week, the classes will be paid for. The cost is 800 rand, which includes the lessons, the videos, assignment help, and our exam our preparation uh, for, 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 for the end of the semester. Then for those of you that are interested in how we do exams and what, join on Saturday when we do the income statement. You will see how we do some of the calculations and how we show you guys to do the what the calculations and whatnot. Are there any questions for me for today? Before we close the lecture, are there any questions? Someone says, please send us the link for today's class. Yes, I'll send it through. I'll just upload it onto my YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'll upload it on the YouTube channel so that you can have access to it uh, for this coming uh, Saturday. Yes, uh, someone has got a question, go ahead. You can type or you can unmute yourself. Lati? Hi, um, yes, Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, um, I just want to find out uh, with mm -hmm. regards to when you, um, um, you know, when you do the calculation of the work, mm -hmm. um, it's on, oh yeah, it's, um, when you calculate someone's financial position, right? Yes. Okay. Um, for an example, it needs you to list all the, the possessions of an individual and then you minus the debtors, right? So you can get the worth of an individual. In a way, I will, I will explain, but continue with the question. In a way, yes, yeah. you're correct. Um, the, a bit more Say, complicated than that, yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay, is, um, does this only apply for to somebody who owns an asset? Can you can you put assets? Can you put a home loan as an asset? Because that okay. home loan is a debt, right? All right, all right, all right. Let, How let's, does let's... it work? Does it apply right. for people with home loans that they have like a a house that okay. they can all right all right Let, let's let's go back to something that i said earlier we, let's go to the accounting equation that usually explains what you're trying to ask accounting equation so there's this statement that i yeah. highlighted on the accounting question where i said what we have is equals to how we bought it so that's okay. that's exactly what assets is equals to equity plus liabilities said. So let's look at an individual, not just a business. Let's just look at an individual. You have a home loan. So if you have a home loan as an individual, think of it this way. Do you have a house? Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct? Because the home loan gave you the house. So the house is physically there. And the house is, is yours. Right? So that's the asset that you have. Right? So that asset is equals to what is it equal to? How did you buy the asset? If you bought the asset through a home loan, which means that you owe F and B a certain amount of money that you use to buy the house. So the asset is always equal to how you bought it. So even when you're preparing the financial position of an individual. So the financial yeah. position of an individual is the assets that the individual has, which is the house that you have, right? And then 
it should always be equal to the liabilities and the equity of that specific individual. How did they obtain that house? So the liability and the equity can either be the loan that you got, or maybe you used your own cash. So which means that you have cash that you had invested into the house. So that's also part of your equity that you have as what well as an individual. Then in essence, uh, you talked about subtracting liabilities. Let me show you something. You talked about mm -hmm. subtracting liabilities. This is an equation, remember? If you've done arithmetic, you, you know what I'm going to do now. This is an equation. This equation and this is the same thing. If I say assets minus liabilities is equals to equity. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing. Because I've just moved assets from one set, liabilities from one side to the other. If you move something uh, when you're doing algebra to one side, it becomes a negative. Right. So okay. if I say assets minus how much I owe other people, it's equal to equity. And remember what we said equity is. Equity is the interest of the owner, which is what you said now, which is your personal worth mm -hmm. as an individual. Right. So if I say assets minus what I owe everyone else, which means what I'm left with is what is actually mine as an individual at the end of the day. Mm. So, so even basically, if the house set up, if I have a house uh -huh. set up, right? although the house might be in my name, if I borrowed money from someone, it means I have to pay back that person that money, which means that my yeah. personal worth cannot be the house. My personal worth is the house less how much I owe that specific person. That becomes my personal worth. But the value of the asset does not change. The value of the asset is always there. But if we subtract the liability, then we get the equity or we get the personal worth of that specific individual at the end of the day. So the important equation is asset is the cost equity plus liability. But if at any point in time, you want to just know what is the equity or what is the personal worth of the individual, then you can subtract the liabilities, which is what you owe other people from the assets for you to get just the equity alone at the end of the day. I hope that's clear to the question that you're asking. Um, so does that mean uh, when, uh, say you purchase the house for 500,000, so it's going mm -hmm. to fall under assets, right? Mm -hmm. Those are your assets, but it's on 500, debt. yes. Mm -hmm. So this, when, when you go to liability side, are you going to put that house 500,000? Because that's, that's also a liability. How much did you borrow to buy the house? 500,000. Yes, then it becomes 500,000. So it means you, you don't have a worth. You, you don't have anything. If you bought a house using a loan and you have not yet paid the loan, then you don't have the house. It's not okay. yours. Yeah. Oh, you okay. Not, no, it's fine. You have not paid for it. Yeah. Yeah. The house becomes yours by the payments that you make. So every little payment that oh. you make increases your value as an individual. But if you have not paid for the house, the bank can oh, come back okay. and repossess the house. Remember? They come back, they okay. repossess the house. Yeah, yeah. Because they are because you've not paid for okay, But then if you've paid uh, something, then you would obviously pay and under the Yes, then you put equity into the house. If you check, um, if you ever listen to Americans in their movies and they talk about how much equity do you have in the house, they're asking how much have you paid back? That's basically what they're asking. How much yeah. have you paid back? But how much of the house belongs to you at the end of the day? I hope okay. that answers. Okay, no, perfect. Thank you so much. All right, cool. It's fine. Uh, let me delete this in case it confuses someone later. All right. Any other questions? When well, someone says Saturday, what time is the class? Uh, uh, Saturday, I usually want to do earlier, probably six o'clock. I will try to do six o'clock on Saturday. I usually prefer to do a bit earlier on Saturday. Let's say six o'clock. I will confirm, but for now, let's put six o'clock. Let's put six o'clock. Like I said, please attend on Saturday because we'll be doing a bit of calculations. I know those ones are very good for you guys. You just, it just opens up your mind in terms of how to prepare your statements and whatnot. So thank you for coming in. I hope you have a pleasant evening. Uh, we shall see each other on uh, Saturday. We shall see each other on Saturday.